Thank you, Laura, for the introduction earlier. And also thank you to the organisers for the invitation to talk to you all today. So what I'm going to cover is um, about the opportunity to take water from abandoned mines and use this as a source of low carbon heat. Sorry, my slide's a bit slow to progress there. So about the Coal Authority and, and who we are, we're a non-departmental government body and our sponsoring department is BAES, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And our role is basically for protection of both people and the environment. And that involves managing surface hazards and also managing water within the coal fields in order to protect surface waters and groundwaters. And what we have in the UK is we have a legacy that's been created by three centuries of deep mining for coal, which ended in 2015 with the closure of Kellingley Colliery. And this has left us with 23,000 or so deep coal mines. And the Coal Authority actually owns this infrastructure. So all the shafts, mine entries, the underground tunnels is owned by ourselves and we license access to it for various purposes. We don't own the water within the workings and we don't own the heat within the water. So there is a bit of a distinction there, but we own the infrastructure itself. And as John's already mentioned, there's a really good overlap between where there's heat demand and where there's coal field. And it's not surprising because so many of our towns and cities were built on the strength of the coal resources that lay beneath them. And also what we have in part of our role in um, protecting the environment, we have over 80 mine water treatment systems where we've got water at surface, either where we pump it out and treat it, or it comes out under gravity and we treat it or not as required before it's um, released to, to surface water. And this is done to both protect the surface waters that receive the mine water and also to protect any overlying groundwater bodies, um, which may be used, for example, for drinking water supply. And at these sites where we've got water at surface, we estimate there's around about 100 megawatts of heat available there that's currently going to atmosphere. So that's one of our priorities in terms of looking at developing these as an energy support source. This depends on their proximity to the end user, of course, so we've got to tie these two together, but because in some areas waters in the mines are still rising, we will have new treatment systems to build in future, and we're looking at could we co-locate those with centres of heat demand as well. So what we've done really is we've been trying to turn what was a liability into an opportunity, and this was very much progressed by uh, my former line manager who, who sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, but he's been very proactive in looking at um, the heat opportunity, which we'll talk about today, the reuse of mine water to form water supply for various different processes, and also the use of the byproducts that are produced from our mine water treatment systems. So we have a market for all of the ochre that comes out of our treatment systems at the moment. So he has been really successful in turn, turning what was viewed as a liability into something of, of value now. And over that 300 years of mining that the UK experienced, around about 17 billion tonnes of coal was extracted from the subsurface. And of course, this has long since been mined and traded and burnt. But the thing I like about the mine energy opportunity is the water that's come in to replace where the coal was in those voids, we can use that over and over again as a source of geothermal heat. So just to... Um, kind of make the link with this section which is very much on geology and the energy transition. My background behind me is not actually a carpet shop or, or, or barrels of whiskey as some people have asked me before but this is actually where we keep our old plans so this is in our heritage centre that's down at our head office near Mansfield and this we've got all the old surveyors notebooks and plans here and this arose from the Coal Mines Regulation Act which was passed in 1872 which made a statutory requirement to deposit plans for mines upon abandonment with the Secretary of State, mainly to improve safety so people knew where things were. Um, if you were planning an adjacent mine, you would know what was there and also to protect kind of concessions within each of the, the mine ownership. And I've got some examples here of the kind of things we're dealing with. Um, and the one on the left is an example from 1855 from the Gateshead area. The one on the right is a much more recent one from 1977. 
from the Sundland area. And all, although the mining surveyors uh, were extremely skilled at, at that time and continue to be so to this day, you can see the difference in the quality of the plans and the amount of information that's on them. So it can be hard to georeference them, which is what we try and do when we're looking to develop a mine energy system. We're looking at where all these things we can see on these plans, where does that actually line up with the surface? So for example, in that Gates example, the, the main thing on there is the river, but of course, the course of that changes over time. So we can't really use that to effectively georeference. We can use shafts if they're still there. And if you've got shafts on the plan and shafts on the, uh, on the land surface and you still know where they are, we can use those. Quite often we use things like churches because they've always been there. So we're literally digging these plans out again and they're forming the basis of what will become low carbon heat schemes that uses the mine energy as a source in the future. And in addition to the mine plans, we've got some other sources of data we use. We've got around about 800 monitoring points across the coal fields where we measure water levels. And at our treatment systems, we also look at water quality as well. And we've had the opportunity as well to work with some of the surveyors um, of the mines who actually worked underground. And that's been really invaluable to get that first hand experience to feed into some of the work that we're doing. And on the, the right hand side um, at the bottom there, we've, we've got a picture of um, some drilling that we're doing on one of our projects and a bit of the core that we got out of the coal measures. And the kind of stripy bit you can see on the left is the coal measure sandstone that's lying above the coal seam. And the, the little layers in that are effectively layers of the land surface that have never been seen by people and have never been exposed to air or, or, or daylight for 320 million or so years, which is amazing when you think about it. But when you go to the, the right hand side of that, you can see that kind of black crumbly bit. That was actually somebody's workplace, that's the scene. So that was seen by people who are working there underground. So for us, when we get um, down to depth and we start bringing the cores up, we cut them open, it's really exciting for us to see what's down there. And just this kind of juxtaposition of stuff that's never been seen by people and you've actually mined through somebody's office. So in terms of deploying mine energy, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. As I've mentioned before, we've got places where we've got water at surface, so you could use that. If you can't access the water at surface, then you can do some targeted drilling. And what you need really for this to take place is you need to have more than one work seam, ideally. They all need to be flooded because the water is the energy carrier and you'd be bringing that out to surface to get the heat from it. And also you really want to have the water levels within the mine um, within 100 metres or so of surface so that you're not spending a fortune on electricity and also increasing the system's carbon um, emissions by using electricity to lift water. So you've got to consider your pumping electricity in your system as well because it can affect the overall coefficient of performance. So a general rule of thumb, you want the water within 100 metres of surface. The temperatures we're commonly dealing with in the northeast coal field are between 12 and 20 degrees, so it gets slightly warmer towards the east. And the way we configure the mine energy systems is that we would drill to a deeper seam and take the water from that and put it back into a shallower seam, having dropped the temperature by about five degrees through the heat exchanger. And then the heat exchanger would interface with the heat pump and the heat network or however the heat user is going to use the heat. The important point here being that the mine water isn't going around the individual buildings. It goes through the heat exchanger and goes back underground. Globally, there's around about 30 schemes that use mine energy on various different scales and types of end use. Um, and the longest running one's been going now for over a decade. And there's um, three or so currently in development in the Northeast region. So we see these demonstrators that are in development at the moment as key to proving the concept. And they're very much being led by local authorities who are being extremely proactive on mine energy, both in the Northeast region and across the UK in general. This is an example from our Seam Garden Village project, which is very much led by Durham County Council. This is using water that we pumped from the former Dorden colliery that closed in 1991. And that's capable of supplying around about 100 litres per second at, 10, at 20 degrees. So that can offer you around about two megawatts of heat. 
which is enough for about 1500 homes. And this development of those 1500 homes, half of them will be affordable. And what we're seeing with this development is um, you can get very close to zero carbon as the grid electricity greens. So for running the heat pumps that you'd be using to lift the temperatures, we're seeing carbon emissions declining over time. And as it stands at the moment, you're looking at around about a 75% reduction in carbon emissions using a heat pump to heat these homes rather than the um, counterfactual of gas. Other benefits imp include improved local air quality, no boilers in people's houses, so you're removing the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning, the stable pricing because you've got a constant supply of water at a constant temperature, and the stable temperatures mean that the coefficients of performance of the system also stay static. So comparing this to a surface water river heat scheme, your temperature there is dropping when you need the heat most, so your coefficient of performance drops as well. So using the ground is a really effective and efficient way of doing things. In terms of the future, this is where we would aspire to get to once we've got some demonstrator projects up and running. So it'd be great to see the mines being used to both store extra heat and, and as a supply of heat. And we could add sources of waste heat into this to increase the, the temperature of the mines. So things like data centers, which require cooling, we could take energy from waste. We could convert renewables that are not producing electricity when it's not required. We could convert that to heat and store in the mine as well. The key thing being that we um, would like to integrate as many of the energy sources and the demands together in this kind of new model. And then you can see on the demand side, there's a couple of opportunities there. So you can use the heat twice effectively. Even if you look at the Dordan and CM example that I've already mentioned, we could heat those homes um, just by dropping the ambient temperature from 20 to 15 degrees. The water that comes out of that scheme at 15 degrees could then go into another project, such as a horticulture project. And that would then bring other benefits. So it could bring employment benefits as well to the area. And the key thing for us about this is that because heat doesn't travel far, as John mentioned earlier, then the benefits have to be local. So if any of you fancy having a bit of a play, this is our interactive viewer. So if you go to um, your browser and you just type in coal interactive map, this should come up. This top box in the corner has got various drop down menus, so you can have a play with those. I've got a few things highlighted here. I chose Durham. And here you can see um, the red crosses, which are mine entries. Most of those will probably be shafts, but many of them will be filled. And then there's a load of polygons you can see here, and it looks a bit messy because these all overlap each other. And these are workings on different scenes, and you can click onto those and it'll tell you how many things are worked. Um, and we've also got this hatched area. Um, there's an example in the center here. These are where we've got probable unrecorded workings, so probably very old workings that we might not have plans for, but we know that the area was worked and we know there's adjacent workings. So there's a likelihood of something being there, which is important when you're looking for places to drill because you need to be aware of workings that might not be recorded as well as the ones that you're trying to hit. There's also another layer on this map for temperatures. So if anybody's interested in looking at coal field temperatures, um, there's another drop down on this, this menu up here. And that was devised um, in conjunction with ourselves and the BGS. So a, a great piece of work there looking at kind of uh, mined temperatures um, when the mines were open and also post abandonment temperatures. So that's that's all in there. So do have a, have a play with that if you're interested. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you of the potential of this resource. Um, and I think for us getting the demonstrators up and running is key, and that's currently underway at three sites in the northeast. So the northeast is really leading the way uh, nationally for this. This provides a sustainable source of heat, which is really um, can be well integrated with other energy sources and other demands. And the fact that heat doesn't have to travel, uh, doesn't travel, so the benefits do have to stay local. And for me, what has been viewed as a liability, which is now having a renaissance as a strategically important asset, both um, for its energy supply, both for the region and for, for national, nationally. And it's really nice to think of all the effort that went into creating those mines in the first place. We can now capitalise on that to provide an energy source for the future. So thanks very much for listening.